Hey guys, welcome to Antioch 30 Live. We are so glad you've tuned in. This is going to be an amazing time of hearing some great biblical truth and how it can apply to your lives. We are excited for this whole series. We start the series tonight, and tonight we're starting with John Merriweather. John Merriweather is going to be talking about what does it mean to be rooted in Christ. So welcome John Merriweather for session one of Antioch 30 Live. Well, hey, good evening. I'm glad you decided to join and listen in. Hey, I'm looking forward to the next couple of weeks and the study that we're going to do, which we're calling Back to the Basics. Hey, I hope you have your Bible. I hope you have a pen and something to write with. And I want to encourage you to really engage in this study. I think you're going to be encouraged as I was as I was preparing, so I'm looking forward to this. Hey, if you do have your Bible, we're going to kind of plant in Colossians chapter 2. It's going to be kind of our home base for the next couple of weeks as, as, as we kind of explore this topic. But as you're going to Colossians chapter 2, as we think about the basics, it brings to mind the idea of, of the fundamentals and being disciplined. And, and that brings to mind a story that I want to share. It goes, takes us all the way back to 1961. And actually, just before that, in 1960, the Philadelphia Eagles played the Green Bay Packers in the NFL championship game. It was a very close game, and ultimately, the Eagles defeated the Packers by a score of 17-13. to Now, the Packers were led by a second-year, unknown, unproven head coach by the name of Vince Lombardi. And the fact that they were in that championship game was, was a pretty significant achievement for that Packers team. Well, fast forward to the beginning of the 1961 season, the 38 athletes that make up the Green Bay Packers football team assembled for their first team meeting to kick off the 1961 season. And they were excited. And they'd had a great season. They had overachieved. They felt a tremendous amount of momentum and growth of their team. And, and they were ready to hit the field and, and start preparing. But their head coach had something a little bit different in mind. He surprised that team. And this first team meeting that, that they had in 1961, Vince Lombardi stands up in front of that team. And he, he had spent the offseason really – looking at his team and what happened in that championship game. What, what was the breakdown that caused that loss? And as he really thought about it and studied that film, he made a decision that would ultimately change the culture of the Green Bay Packers. And as he stood up in the 1961 season to start that season to address his team, he reached down and he lifted out his hands and he simply said this. He said, gentlemen, this is a football. Gentlemen, this is a football. What was Lombardi saying to his team. See, what he recognized was, what, was that in the pressure moments of the game, when the team was tired, they had a breakdown in the fundamentals. And he made a commitment from that time forward that the Green Bay Packers would be the most disciplined, fundamentally sound, well-executing football team in pro football. Hey, the result was pretty astounding. Between 1961 and 1967, the Green Bay Packers won five NFL championships. And Vince Lombardi never experienced another playoff loss. That's a pretty amazing achievement. Vince Lombardi understood how important it was to be grounded and disciplined in the fundamentals. Well, that's what we're going to talk about for the next couple of weeks, how important it is for us as Christians to know what we believe and to be grounded in the fundamentals. You know, the Scripture kind of shares a similar story, and it gives us kind of a similar charge of being grounded in the fundamentals. And we find that in Colossians chapter 2. And I'm going to read that for us, and I hope that you're able to follow along. Colossians 2, I'm going to pick it up in verse 4, and we're going to read through verse 7. And here's what Paul says to the, to the church at Colossae. He says this. He says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Does that sound familiar today? For though I am absent from you in the body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith is in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Being disciplined and firm in your faith, being rooted and built up in Christ. And in this, we get this picture of how important it is to be firmly rooted in what it is that we believe and who it is that we believe. Why is this so important for us? Let me just kind of give you three real quick bullet points, and we're not going to talk about these in detail, but there's really three reasons that we'll cover over the next couple of weeks of why is it important for us to be firmly rooted in the foundations of our faith. Number one, our roots determine our identity. Our roots 
if we're rooted in Christ or if we're rooted in something else, ultimately determines the person that we are going to be and the person we're going to become. Our roots also provide stability and strength for the turbulent times in our life. And finally, our roots are what enable our growth. Our roots provide the nourishment that we need to grow. So the question is, are we rooted in Christ? And, and remembering what it means to be rooted in Christ so for the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at this idea of being rooted and built up. This week, we're going to look at what every Christian ought to know about being rooted in Christ. And then next week, we're going to look at what's next. What does it mean to grow and be built up in Christ? So I hope that you'll join us for both of these two studies. Well, let's jump in. We're going to cover four points today about what every Christian ought to know about being rooted in Christ. And these are going to seem so familiar to so many of us but I'm going to contend I can't think of anything more important that we need to hold and tether ourselves to than some of these principles. Whatever Christian ought to know about being rooted in Christ, number one is this, and it is so simple, but it is so profoundly important. The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. You may hear that and say, well, of course it is. Well, we're going to unpack that, and we're going to talk about what do we mean by that, but you know, Scripture makes that claim of itself. 2 Timothy 3.16 starts this way. It says, all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. The Bible makes that claim that it is God's words. 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says it this way. It says, no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what do we mean when we say the Bible is God's Word? The Bible is God's Word. Well, there's a couple of things that we believe that that means. First of all, we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, and the word inerrant means without error. It is the inerrant, without error, and the literal words from God, penned by men, but only as they were directed by the Holy Spirit. That's the claim of Scripture. We believe that the Bible is without error, that it is perfect, and it is the literal words that God wanted us to hear from Him about Him. That's what we believe about the Scripture. Do you believe that? Do you believe that every word of Scripture is absolutely true? Because we believe that, we also believe that it is the authoritative standard for the believer's faith and our practice. We believe that the Bible is the authoritative standard, that the Bible contains the absolute truth, moral truth for mankind. For many people today, that's a bold claim. Many of us, and you may feel this way, wonder if there's not a war going on against Scripture today. You know what? There's been a war going on against Scripture since the beginning of time. It's always been that way. But for the context in which you and I live Today, certainly there is more op opposition against Scripture than there has ever been. Let me demonstrate it this way. In 2014, the Barna Research Group, a Christian research group, did a survey, and the results were really astounding and scary. In this survey of the Baptists, not just the general adult population, but of people that identify as Baptists, of those surveyed, 44% did not believe that the Bible is totally accurate. 44% of Baptists do not believe that the Bible is completely accurate. When I heard that, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of astounded. Where does that leave us? Well, 55% of practicing Christians believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God and that moral truth is absolute. Where does it leave you if you don't believe that the Bible is completely accurate? Here are some of the other statistics from that survey from the same group of Baptists. The 44% that didn't believe that the Bible is totally accurate. Other statistics from that survey. 66% did not believe that Satan was an actual real person. 57% believe that it requires works to be saved. And 45% believe that Jesus was not sinless. George Barna, the president of the Barna Research Group, 
concluded this about the survey. He said, the Christian body in America is immersed in a crisis of biblical illiteracy. Biblical illiteracy. So what's the result of this growing issue about Scripture and the Bible and its authoritative standard and its absolute truth? Well, the result is what we're beginning to see in our society, and that is this increasing moral and religious relativism. Anything can possibly be true, and any road can possibly lead to the God that can save you. We do not believe that. We believe that truth is absolute, that there is only one way. If we're going to be firmly rooted in Christ, we must be firmly rooted in Scripture. If Scripture is not completely true, if it is not without error, then that leaves us open to question about anything in our faith. So how can we know the Scripture is true? It claims to be true. It claims to be the literal words of God. We certainly don't have time to do an entire study on this, but let me give you a couple of things. You know, We could talk about how Scripture has proven to be scientifically and prophetically accurate. It has proven to be absolutely scientifically and prophetically accurate, and you can study that, and you can research that and see the studies that have been done. It is the most accurately and robustly preserved historical manuscript from the ancient world. Did you know that? You can go back to original manuscripts and the replication of those and, and review the accuracy and the detail and, and, and the number of manuscripts that have been produced of, of Scripture. And it is by far the most accurate and robustly preserved manuscript from the ancient world. But I really want us to look at two quick things, just real quickly. I want us to look at the wonderful unity of the Bible. The wonderful unity of the Bible. Let's look at the construct of this book. I just want you to think about this. Look at the construct. What we call the Bible is actually 66 individual books. 39 what we call Old Testament books and 27 New Testament books. These 66 books that come together to create the Bible, the Holy Scriptures, were written over a span of 1,600 years. I'm going to pause. 1,600 years. We can say that and we can gloss over that, but let's not do that. Think about 1,600 years. 1,600 years ago from where we sit today would take us back to 400 A.D. What was happening in 400 A.D. and how relevant could what was happening in that context be applicable for us today? Well, that's the Bible. It covers a span of 1,600 years. It was written in three languages by 40 different people from 13 countries and three continents and these people spanned all walks of life. What's the relationship that brings all of this together? Well, we know that that's exactly what happens. This mosaic of these 66 individual books, when you put them together, creates an incredibly unifying story beginning in Genesis and ending in Revelation. And when you put those 66 books together, what you find is one common thing that is found threaded throughout all of these books, and that is God's redemption plan for mankind. The one theme of the Bible is redemption. God's redemptive plan for mankind. There's one hero of the Bible, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one villain of the Bible, the devil, and there is one purpose for the Bible, the glory of God. The Bible exists to put a spotlight on who God is and how we can come to know Him. It's all about Him. It's incredible to think that over a 1,600 year span, 66 individual books could be written that when you put it together, create a completely cohesive and unifying story of redemption about our God and about our need for Him. One final thing that I want you to think about, about we, why we can believe the Bible is true, and that is that it has transforming power. Hebrews 4.12 says, The Word of God is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It has been said of Scripture that we may read other books, but the Bible is the only book that reads us. Hey, if you've been a Christian for very long and you've immersed yourself in your word, His Word, you know that's true. Unlike any book ever written in the history of man, the Bible affects people in ways that no other book ever has. It has transforming power. It has stood the test of time. It has withstood opposition. It has withstood the skeptics. It is culturally as relevant today as it has ever been. Isaiah 48 says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God will stand forever. 
Do you believe that the Bible is totally accurate? I mean, that's the bedrock of our foundation. Everything we believe is found in Scripture. And we need to believe that it's totally accurate. I found this quote from the French philosopher Voltaire who said this. He said, if we want to destroy this Christian religion, we must first of all destroy man's belief in the Bible. And that's what society is trying to do today. Hey, Christian, the greatest enemy of the Bible is not the unbeliever. As much as we want to think it is, as much as we want to think society is our greatest enemy, the greatest enemy of the Bible is the Christian who ignores it or chooses to disregard it. Oh, may we never choose to disregard Scripture. Let's move on. The second thing that we believe to be firmly rooted in Christ is the plan of salvation. And it's so simple, and we've heard it so many times. We believe that salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. It's that simple. Salvation is by grace through faith in Christ. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1, and we're going to bounce through verses 1 and 4. And we'll make our way down to verse 9. In verse 1 it says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And verse 4 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in those transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And then verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of work so that no one can boast. I love those passages because it lays out the plan of salvation in such clarity and it emphasizes that it is all about God and that's what I love. Let's look at these three things real quickly. Salvation is by grace. Grace. You know, our pastor has just recently talked about grace. Man, is there anything more important for us to really grasp than this incredible, unimaginable, almost impossible to put into words saving grace of Christ. What is grace? Well, we might be familiar with the idea that it's, it's, it's being given something we do not deserve. Being given something we don't deserve. In Christian circles, you might hear grace described as the unmerited favor of Christ. Unmerited, the undeserving favor of Christ. Well, I, I want to offer you a different, or a new, maybe a new definition for some of you. Adrian Rogers describes grace this way. He says, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Our saving is an act of God's grace, His free gift to anyone who believes, through the atoning sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. God's riches at Christ's expense. Hey, grace is so important. I, I want us to just not move past this too quickly. Let, let's, let's, let's unpack grace just a little bit, and I won't even begin to do it justice it is so deep. It is so rich. We could spend so much time talking about it. But, but let me just whet your appetite a little bit and remind you of when we receive God's gift of grace, let's think about some of the things that that means, some of the things that Christ did for us. First of all, through His grace, He redeems us. He redeems us. Ephesians 1.7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to His riches and grace. He redeems us. We owed a debt because of our sin that we could not possibly pay. And we had an appointment with a judge where we were going to be condemned to die because of our sin. But through the atoning sacrifice of Christ, He redeems us. He paid a debt that we owed that we couldn't pay. He paid that debt for us. That's what the atoning sacrifice of Christ did for us. He redeems us and He paid that debt and He brought us back into a right relationship with Him. You know, there's a little bit more to that idea of Him redeeming us in addition to redeeming us. And how does He do that? He does that by imputing His righteousness to us. So what does impute mean? Impute simply means to attribute or to assign His righteousness. Jesus' righteousness was assigned to us. It was, it was accounted to our account. Romans 5, 4, 6 says, To whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. And in the idea that He gives us His righteousness... He goes a little step further and says, not only do I attribute my righteousness to you, I do not attribute your future sins to you. He does not impute future sin to our account. Romans 4, 8 said, Blessed is the man to whom God, to, to whom the Lord does not impute sin. So what's the result of this? The result of the, this grace 
is that he effectively frees us or eliminates the possibility that we could ever face judgmental condemnation. We never have that possibility in our future. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord, or Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, his grace is incredible. Man, we need to just let it marinate and remind ourselves of what he did, not what we've done. We've done nothing but what his grace does for us. So how do we receive this gift of grace? Through a simple act of faith. Simply having faith. What is faith? In one word, faith is trust. Trusting in Christ. I like this definition that says, Faith is forsaking all, I trust Him. Forsaking all, I trust Him. You know, many of us have heard the illustration of faith that we can talk about believing in something, but until we put our full weight, just like this chair I'm sitting on, until I fully sit on this chair, I haven't acted in faith. I haven't demonstrated my trust. This idea of forsaking all, I trust Him. I really love that view of faith because it really, I think it puts it into, into totality. For us to receive the gift of grace, the first thing that we have to do is forsake, right? We have to repent, turn away from, forsake my sin, forsake my will, my way, forsake my perceived goodness, recognizing that that's, uh, we've only separated ourselves from God and there's nothing that we can do, right? We've got to turn away from ourselves, repent and forsake and place our entire trust on Christ. And the, and, the, and the picture here of faith is turning from our way and our sin and simply lifting our hands to Christ and saying, I trust you. I trust you. And when we lift our hands of faith to Christ, it's as though His grace grabs us. It's His grace that saves us. It's not our faith. It's His grace. Faith is just the conduit that allows His grace to save us. And it's not faith in anything it's faith in Jesus Christ. It's not our faith that saves us. It is the object of our faith. It is not our faith that saves us. It's the object of our faith. Acts 4.12 says this crystal clear. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It is not religious pluralism. All roads do not lead to God. Jesus Christ is the only way. We are saved by grace through faith in Christ. Hey, let me add one more thing to this definition of salvation. It may be a word that you haven't thought about, but I'm going to challenge you to just adopt this when you think about salvation and when you think about the gospel and even as you share it. Because this one word, when applied to this definition, differentiates the gospel, the true gospel message from any other version that you may hear. And that word is alone. Alone. Think about it. It's not just that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, but that is the only way we're saved. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That narrows it down, don't you think? But hey, here's what that's saying to us. And this is what Ephesians 2 tells us. There is nothing that we can do to earn God's favor. It is not of works. It is by grace alone. Through faith alone. Not through faith in anything else. Not through faith in, in, in trying to do good things. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ and no other. In Christ alone. We are helpless hopeless people. We cannot add to, alter, or take away from God's redemptive plan of the gospel. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ only. Alone. A powerful word that crystallizes our view of salvation. Hey, those two tenets, the Bible is the complete, literal, and errant, accurate word of God that is sufficient for us, and the gospel is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is our cornerstone. That is our firm foundation. Well, hey, let me give you a couple of other things to consider that, that, that only serve to strengthen that identity in Christ. And the third point of it is this. We can know 
we're saved. We can know it as a certainty. We call this doctrine in, in Christian circles the assurance of salvation. The assurance of our salvation. We need a doctrine of assurance because we have a problem with doubt. Right? We're humans. And time and again, we've proven that their doubt will creep in. As a testimony, I have certainly doubted, especially as a, as a young person. I was saved when I was nine years old, and I, I went through a period as a teenager where I really struggled and questioned the authenticity of my faith and whether I was truly secure in Christ. But here's what I've come to learn. It's hard to be an effective Christian if we're a doubting Christian. There's nothing in the Scripture or everything in the Scripture reminds us that God does not want His children to live in this cloud of uncertainty. That is not God's desire for His child. It's God's desire for His children that we embrace the living hope that we have in Him. He doesn't want us to be scared or, or, or uncertain because that's only going to hinder our effectiveness. He wants us to live courageously and confidently in Him in the certain reality of our future. Hey, maybe this is why the book of 1 John seems to be almost dedicated to this topic of knowing for sure that you're a child of God. All right? Clearly, early Christians struggled with the same thing that you and I often struggle with. The book of 1 John uses the word know, K-N-O, know, 38 times. And it ends the book this way. In 1 John 5, 13, he says this. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. When we think about dealing with, with doubt, and I, and, I, and I read that verse, I want you to think about this. The Bible always uses definitive language to reference our salvation. Have you ever thought about that? The Bible always uses definitive language to reference our salvation. Let me give you a few examples. Romans 10.13 says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's no ambiguity there. Not might be, could be, will be saved. John 3.16 says the same thing. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans or Hebrews 10.14 says, For by one sacrifice he has made perfect those who are being made holy. The Bible uses definitive language to reference a person's salvation. God does not want us to doubt. So why do we doubt? Why is doubt a reality for so many Christians? Well, there's, there's a number of reasons. Um, and we could, we could talk about this, and your experience may be different than somebody else's. I think sometimes we doubt because, you know, maybe in my case I was saved as a young child, and I was really trying to go back and, and put myself back at that time that I was saved and, and kind of remember, you know, was my faith strong and what did I say? And, 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 and oftentimes we try to go back to an event in our past for our assurance. Hey, sometimes it's because we recognize sin in our lives. Right? We see where we are and we recognize that, hey, as a Christian, I shouldn't be here. Maybe, maybe I'm not saved. Right? Maybe it didn't take not to make that light, but maybe it didn't take, right? Listen, there's any number of reasons why we might doubt, but almost always doubt is a result of taking our eyes off of the one who authors our salvation. It's almost always a result of our own inspection of ourselves when we stop focusing on and fixing our eyes on Christ, the one who authors our faith. John Popper said this, and I just want you to listen to it, and I really, I really like how he said this, and I think this is accurate. He said, you can become fixated on yourself, which will not produce the very thing you're trying to produce. The person who is analyzing their motives all the time, analyzing their fervor all the time, or analyzing their doctrinal clarity all the time will defeat the very thing they're after. The reason is because we don't get assurance mainly from looking in the mirror we get assurance mainly from looking at Christ and the sufficiency of His work on the cross. What are your eyes fixed on? right? If we're just inspecting ourselves, we're going to see the flaws, we're going to have doubts. But when we fix our eyes on the author of our faith and His sufficiency of His work on the cross, that eliminates those doubts. It is not our feelings nor the intensity of our faith 
that saves us. It is the object of our faith. So if you're struggling with doubt, man, I really encourage you to deal with that. Talk to somebody about that. The other thing that I would encourage you is this. Don't try to make your salvation about something that happened in the past. Salvation is always a present tense reality. The question is, are you believing and do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Are you believing in Him today? Are you having faith in Him today? Jesus says, I am the way. If you have faith in Jesus, He will save you. It's not our feelings. It's not the intensity of of our fervor. It's the sufficiency of His work on the cross. Are you believing in that for your salvation? Hey, that's a powerful, powerful statement for any Christian to be able to say, I'm saved and I know it. That's a powerful statement. But can I tell you, I don't think it's the most powerful statement in the life of a Christian. I think there's something that's even more powerful and it takes us to our final point today. Right? As great as it would be to be able to say, I know I'm saved. I'm confident that I'm saved. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I think there's something that's even more powerful than that. And that's when I can say, I know I'm saved and I know I can never lose it. I know I'm saved today and I know I'm going to be saved forever. That's the most powerful statement in the life of a Christian. Point number four, we can never lose our salvation. We call this the security of the believer, the doctrine of security. You see, we just talked about assurance of salvation, and assurance of salvation is really our perspective of our salvation. But when we talk about security, the inability to lose it, We're really talking about God's perspective of our salvation. Remember, He's the one that does the saving. The question is, is are we secure in Him? Because there's nothing we can do to be saved. So security of the believer is God's perspective of our salvation. Well, listen to what God says about His perspective of our salvation. John 10, 27 through 28, He says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. There's that definitive language that I love so much. They will never perish. No one will ever snatch them out of my hand. There's no ambiguity there. There's no possible opposite course of action. They will never perish. Ephesians 1, 13, 14 says this. It says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. It's a guarantee. Let me give you something to think about. Maybe you've never thought about this before. Maybe you're not that familiar with Scripture, but I know many of you are very familiar with Scripture. Can you think of a single example in Scripture of a person who lost their salvation and come to be saved a second time? I can't think of any. There's no example in Scripture of someone who had been saved, lost it, and came to be saved a second time. I think that would be an important principle of the gospel if that were true. Hey, here's something else that gives me confidence in the security of a believer. And it's this idea that the Bible describes our salvation as a new birth. Right? That that which was dead, which we read in Ephesians chapter 2, that which was dead, spiritually speaking, is made alive In Christ, we're born again, as John chapter 3 describes it. We're born again, which means we're born from above. We're given new life. Now, think about that. And we use that term a lot, that we're a child of God, that we've been adopted into His family, that He is our Father. We've been given new birth. Well, think about the context of being born. Right? There's a lot that we could talk about. I'm just going to give you two points. Consider this. A birth is a once and for all event. It is a once and for all event. You cannot be unborn. You can't be unborn to be born a second time. A birth is a once and for all event. If you have been born spiritually, saved, you can't be unborn. I like this idea as well. When you think about your birth, you receive the DNA of your parents. right? And that's what Ephesians 1 tells us that we receive. We receive the promised Holy Spirit a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us when we're saved. And that is the guarantee of our salvation. We receive the DNA of our parents. Birth is a once and for all event. You can't be unborn. And we've received his DNA. 
were secure in his arms. Think about this. The moment that you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your responsibility as a sinner having to do with the God of judgment is ended for eternity. But at that same moment, your responsibility as a child having to do with the Father in heaven begins. Our relationship with Christ changes from that of a judge to that of a father. Hey, if, a, if as a child we sin against the Father, we'll have to deal with that sin in our lives. But not as a judge to condemn, but as a father to train up. Future sin does not make us unrighteous. It makes us disobedient. But God's righteousness, which has been attributed to our account, continues to cover our sins. You know, as I was preparing this lesson, I, I realized that so many of these points are going to be so familiar and so basic. But isn't that the point? I mean, isn't that the point? Do we ever outgrow the fundamentals? When we, when, we, when we hear that, it reassures us of our identity in Christ. It reminds us of what He has done for us, right? Listen, as a believer, if you are a believer, we are not any better than anybody else. We're only better off. And we're not better off because of anything that we brought to the table, nor are we better off because of anything we bring to the table today. We're only better off for one reason, because the blood of Jesus Christ covers us. His righteousness has been assigned to us. Man, if that doesn't give us courage, if that doesn't give us boldness, if that doesn't provide the security to grow in Him, man, I'd hope that it does for you. Hey, whatever storms, trials, circumstances, opposition, we can rest secure in the fact the Bible is true and accurate it's proven itself time and time again. It is ageless. It is timeless. It's as relevant today as it has ever been. It clearly lays out our need for a Savior and His redemption plan that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. And that if we've ever placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there's no reason to walk around with a cloud of doubt and uncertainty. We can know that as sure as we can know that we're sitting here watching this lesson and here's the final thing that we can know. We can know that we can never lose it. We can know we're saved, and we can know that we can never lose it. The most powerful truth that ought to just engulf us as a Christian. Hey, live confidently in that firm foundation. Tether ourselves to being rooted in Christ, strengthened and stable to be able to withstand anything because nothing can change the living hope that we have in Christ. Hey, thank you for tuning in this week. I hope this was an encouragement to you. We're going to continue this lesson next week. We've talked about being rooted in Christ. Colossians tells us that we need to be rooted and built up in the faith. So how do we grow in the faith? How do we grow in our faith so that we become the Christian, the believer that we're intended to be? Looking forward to next week. Thank you for joining in today. Have a good evening.